your victims were there? I didn't select them. It was random. And it was uh, also the, the development of the passion. If I was drove, they died. Like the last two victims. I was so pissed I'd have killed anybody and got in the car. But there was times I drove a woman and her son clear up into Oregon, crossed over to the coast highway and drove back down. And like 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, fog, misty highway, and I'm driving along. There's not a car near me. I'm, it's totally alien county. This is way up around Eureka or something. And here's these two high, probably high school girls. They looked up at me 17 or 18 years old. They're hitching the first ride into town because they've snuck off the farm. They've gone the half a mile or so up to the road, and they're going to hit on into town, have a good time, and sneak back. It was obvious because they were grabbing the first ride they could get. And here I've been fighting my inner impulses to not go off on this woman and her 12-year-old son who's hitchhiking clear back to Seattle, right? And I'm struggling with these feelings. I don't want to do it. Man, you ought to do it anyway. You're weak. You're a punk. Nah, I don't want to do it. All day long I'm doing this. And by the time I'm coming back down that highway, I'm exhausted. I'm saying, oh, whoa, and I'm driving along just to get home. And here's a perfect situation. I cannot get busted. It exceeds the criterion of picking someone up and not getting caught. No one knows me in the county. No one's seen me going through it, right? It's a fog shroud at night. Nobody could even see me if their home was in view. And I don't know them. I picked them up. We drove into town about two miles, three miles. I dropped them off. I got some gas and kept right on going. I was not in a proper state of mind to do something like that. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. It was like it was handed to me on a platter. Scared the hell out of me. I couldn't do it. I had everything I needed. And to go back to your first... Uh... Again, so about the selection and the preparation. If I was selecting and preparing and everything was all set, that's it. I got them. But I didn't. They're not dead. That, I show that as an example of many times that kind of thing happened. All of a sudden, somebody shows up out of nowhere. I pick them up, take them where they're going, but I didn't do nothing to them because it was, uh, the mindset was all wrong. The only time people got killed was when she and I was fighting like cats and dogs, and I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't vent it any other way. I look back on it, and I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying I'm looking back, I'll go back on it and saying, I think they were surrogates. I was killing her, not them. I was attacking her station. I was attacking her stance in that university setting. Also, I hated the university for what it was doing to her. She worked her butt off. They took every bit of it. Oh, yeah, we love that. Okay, here's some more. You want some more authority? You want some more responsibility? Here. It was eating her up. She went into that job sober. She came out of the job damn near canned because she went to work drunk one day. She couldn't cope with it, and it was destroying her a little at a time. She needed help, but if you told her she needed a mental hospital, if I told her she needed a mental hospital, if my little sister told her she needed a mental hospital or a dry-out program, it peeled our skin for us. We did not mess with that woman. My sister, my little sister, was cheating on her husband when my mother was murdered. If she had known my little sister was doing that, she'd have, she probably would have been out of the family. That was totally outrageous to her Victorian mores as she grew up. These twisted Victorian bullshit uh, ideals that her mother laid on her as a kid and twisted her life with. And then she tried to run that shit on my dad. You said you had a lot of sympathy and empathy towards Marianne Peshik when you talked to her. But isn't that strange to say that after you had killed her in such a brutal fashion? There was a draw. There was a draw to the young lady that was haunting. I'm not saying I had compassion toward her when I talked to her. I tried to remember what we talked about. And in fact, I think what I said about her was is that she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady. She's kind of stuck up, distant. I look back on it and I see a girl that was not beautiful, she was not plain, she was somewhere in between, and she was caught up in that beauty thing, like kids in the valley are, okay? Valley girls, trying to make something of themselves and exploit little attributes they have and to downplay other ones. And she was playing a little Miss Distant with me. And her friend was very open and very, her roommate was very open and very a country girl talking and stuff. And it's sad because the Pesh was the, uh, Marianne was the uh, expert at hitchhiking. She had been half her life in Europe. She'd hitchhiked around Europe. Uh, she'd done it in the United States. She was good at it. She didn't want to get in the car. 
but she had talked her, she had two roommates, okay, and one went on the trip with her to Berkeley and to Stanford and back to Fresno State. Only one would go with her. And apparently, I'm thinking back, the other one was so close to going that later when she found out what happened to her two roommates, she dropped out of college. She came to testify at my trial. And she was devastated by the whole thing. So I'm thinking she almost went. And she realized she might have died too. Who knows? But uh, I don't even know that I'd have picked them up if there's three of them. I don't know. I don't know if they'd have been where they were. All the circumstances could have changed. But I, I'm thinking that it, uh, because it had such a violent effect on her college education, she was that close to going. The other girl, Anita Luchessa, wasn't a hitchhiker. She had been raised by her family. You don't do things like that. That's totally out of line. And her friend talked her into it. And once she got into it and she saw how much fun it was and they meet the different people and they talk with people, that by the time they're leaving Berkeley, right, it's all about who gets the front seat and who gets the back seat. So she, she, uh, you know, she opened the door and asked where uh, I was headed. I mean, it says Stanford right on there, the sign they were holding up. And I said, I'm going to Palo Alto. I can drop you off. Oh, great. And she jumps in, grabs her stuff, jumps in, opens the back seat up for her friend who's standing there looking at me long and serious about whether or not, because I could tell at the time. She knows better than to get in. Single adult, it's a coupe instead of a four-door car, so she cannot get out other than through the front seat. So that's all the warning signs of not getting in with a single, you know, in that kind of a situation. Uh, all of the things were wrong about it. But when I drove up, I pulled that little stunt of looking at my watch. You know, do I have time to pick them up? And you wouldn't believe how much effect that kind of thing has. And when she kept staring at me and looking, looking for something wrong in my eyes, I gave this look back like, I don't understand, why, why are you looking at me like this? I gave her that back and she says, oh, this guy's a dork, he's innocent as hell. She gets in. Okay, we're driving along and I'm looking at this young lady in the rearview mirror. And I look back at it years later and I'm saying, she kept looking me back too, right in the eyeballs. I'm wearing dark glasses, but they're not totally dark. And I'm realizing now that she could see me looking at her and she was looking right back at me. And instead of saying something to me, like, what are you looking at? Or, hey, maybe you ought to drop us off or something like that. She just kept looking back at me. And I'm looking at her, and she keeps looking at me. I'm thinking she's playing this little game. It's, uh, it's not really teasing, so to speak. It's just this little psychological game back and forth that men and women do sometimes. The young girl in the front, uh, Anita, was uh, at one. Uh, at first I did, yeah, but that stopped. Because... Uh, at first, I was hoping I could get off, I could get a vicarious thrill out of seeing those pictures and say, well, this will be satisfying enough. One, two people die, that's it. It doesn't have to go past that. And I'll see why I don't want to do it again. Those pictures lasted about two weeks. And I come back from work two days after I did it. I mean, Tuesday, right? Sunday it happened. Monday I took off, took CTO. Uh, compensatory time off and I go back to work Tuesday. I come home from work Tuesday, a hard day at work. I'm feeling like I used to feel. I've done some work that day. I've accomplished something. And I'm saying, I can't believe I did this stuff. I must have dreamed it. This must be some kind of weird dream. And I come back to the house. I pick up the corner of the carpet. I pull out these pictures and I, in an envelope and I say, geez, I don't believe this. Now i got to believe it. That really happened. See, I was that distanced from what I had done just one day later that I couldn't believe, or two physical days later, that I couldn't believe that I'd actually done that. After two weeks, I couldn't handle the reality of those pictures. Now, I've seen, I've read where guys have hung criminals, like in the Old West, and tanned the guy's hide and made a pair of shoes out of it. The doctor did, because this is a city doctor, and took his skull and made an inkwell out of it with gold hinges on it for the pens. And this was some notorious criminal, right? I said, gee, that's kind of grisly. Why did you take out the dead body? Was it a kind of way to replace the sexual experience? I think so. I think so. It was a. I think so, and it was a, like a trophy thing. It was. Uh, it's disgusting, but it was a, kind of a power trip. Uh, I always felt intimidated by women. I always felt overpowered by them as a kid. When I stopped making it as an adult, when I I was doing great socially on the job base making friends locally, having buddies and stuff, and, you know, have a pizza and a beer and stuff. No problem. I got friends for that. But making women friends was real tough. 
and uh, battling my mom on the one hand and trying to make friends with women is a little bit of a problem because there was a lot of crossover there. And she was opening a lot of old wounds, pushing a lot of buttons, and she liked to watch me twitch. That's the only thing I can say. There was a little bit of sadism in her, too. And I hated her for that because she was the one person in the world that could push every button I had because she knew where they all were. And as I got better and smarter and, and, and better at what I did and, you know, more involved in the public and, and uh, I'd say a better all-around adult, it's as if she were offended by that. And you may ask why, okay? Just look at the vanity of being a mother. She raised me, had a horrible time from day one as an individual parent raising me. Uh, fight every day, right? The state comes in. She's a proud woman. She's a, a vain woman. She was real proud, and I'm, she was raised that way. The state of California takes her son away from her and says, we are taking your son away because you must be an unfit mother. He's a murderer. He killed people. I'm trying to look at it from her point of view. If you could raise your son right, you wouldn't kill people, lady. We're taking him. And in a mere five and a half years of bureaucracy, and she had nothing, she had no respect for California bureaucracy. She used to make jokes about that all the time. About if you want, you know, if you want to waste the rest of your life doing nothing, apply for something, and, you know, through a bureaucratic process in California. Those bureaucrats took me away from her. And in five and a half years of filter farbing around, they hand me back, and now I'm an overachiever. Huh? Good-looking, strapping young man, wants to go work, wants to make a living for himself, wants to be sociable. He isn't paranoid and pulling away from people anymore. That shocked the hell out of her. It had to have. She didn't share that with me, but I'm saying that must have really tore at her and made her feel all the more a bad mother. So instead of, I have a feeling she felt she couldn't be a part of that healing process. So she attacked it because I became a cancer in her life. I reminded her every day what a rotten mother she must be. And I'm not saying she was. She must be a rotten mother. Look what the state did for me, and she couldn't. They couldn't have insulted her any worse if they'd have tried, and they didn't try. They were trying to solve a problem by paroling me to her so I'll stay out of trouble and go be a good adult and pay taxes. And guess what? That's the one furnace they should not have put me back in because, hey, she had no help on the other end to sort through her feelings, and she was too proud to get help. So we fought, and we fought, and that's the only excuse I can make in my head. She's not here to discuss it. That's the only thing I can, the balance I can put in there is that I must have been a terrible accuser to her, a terrible accusal of what a rotten mother she was, or she could have done better. Even the state raised me with apparent ease. They locked me away in an adult institution where I should have been raped and I should have been mutilated and I should have been screwed over and been a, like Charlie Manson when he was raped as a kid in prison in youth authority. You know? And then he starts raping other people and he's a leader of that stuff and then he's manipulating people.